Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our Operative Dentistry series. In the last video we talked all about the caries process and in this one we're going to talk about practically how do we as clinicians detect the presence of caries and also non-carious defects. So the clinical exam for detecting caries typically revolves around these four things. We're looking for visual changes in the tooth surface texture or color, and in many cases both. Tactile sensation with careful use of an explorer. We're also looking at radiographs, and in some cases we're doing what's called transillumination. So let's go through each of those four things one at a time. So the meat and potatoes of caries detection is visual, and this kind of examination should always be conducted in a dry, well-illuminated field. And that's because moisture and poor lighting can make it much, much more difficult to accurately detect caries. A specific example of this is that incipient caries, that's that, ir that's that reversible type of lesion that, is, uh, not, that has not cavitated the enamel surface. So the incipient caries lesion partially or totally disappears from vision by wetting, while hypocalcification does not. So when we're conducting this exam, it's doubly important to keep everything dry because if something, if the tooth is wet and covered in saliva, we can actually totally miss an incipient lesion. That's important to take account of and monitor so that it doesn't progress down the road. And hypocalcification or hypomineralization is a permanent defect in the enamel from when the tooth was initially maturing. And this usually doesn't need to be treated unless there's an aesthetic concern. So that's one way to differentiate between something that is carious versus something that's not. The next arm of the clinical exam is tactile. So again, we want everything dry. This picture shows a nice view of how we keep the field isolated. You can place cotton rolls in the buccal and lingual vestibules, the lingual vestibule for the lower, of course, and remove ex excess saliva with suction. And you do this in tandem with the visual exam. So you can lightly air dry each tooth as you go. Now, classically, you would feel a stick with the Explorer where a little bit of softness is indicative of caries. But recently, there's been a lot of pushback to this philosophy for several reasons. Number one, you have to be very careful with sharp explorers not to iatrogenically introduce a cavitation. What I mean is you can actually push too hard on an incipient lesion that has lost some amount of mineral and create a tiny little cavitation, which is now by definition irreversible, whereas it was reversible before you had intervened. A tactile exam can also give a false positive because the explorer tip could get hung up on a non-carious defect. Say the shape of the pit or fissure is just a little bit strange and it catches the explorer. That could give you a false positive when that's not actually a carious lesion. And number three, there's some evidence that you can transfer cariogenic bacteria with the tip of the explorer from infected areas to non-infected areas. So for all those reasons, there are different trains of thought, but there's, again, an ongoing debate between whether or not the tactile exam is actually as good as people once thought it was. All right, next we have the radiographic exam. And there's little debate about this. It's incredibly valuable. The dental carries as we understand it now from our last video, is a dynamic process that can progress through demineralization, can arrest or regress through remineralization. And as we talked about, it usually takes about one to two years for a white spot to cavitate. So when we're talking about the staging or the progress of a carious lesion, white spots are gonna be hardly visible on the radiograph. It's a little less even than what we see here at R1. Very hard to, to visualize in a radiograph. The enamel cavitation is going to be evident. 
So it's kind of what we're seeing here where there is a physical cavitation in the enamel surface and we're already going to have some amount of dentin demineralization if you're remembering our caries progress from left to right in the last video. And then we next, next we have the dentinal lesion, which is going to be clearly evident. It's kind of what we're seeing at R2 and also R3, where the caries has clearly progressed and cavitated through into the dentin layer. Interestingly though, lesions are always smaller radiographically than clinically. And that's because the tooth needs 30 to 40% mineral loss before it's detectable on uh, a radiograph. So if you're only at 10% mineral loss, it won't even show up on the x-ray. So the x-ray lags behind reality just a little bit. And that's an important concept to know for the board exam. Also important, the PA or the periapical x-ray is best for anterior caries detection, whereas the bite wing for posterior caries detection. Although the periapical can be used as well, but the bite wing shows the most accurate progression of the caries. And lastly, we have trans illumination. This is the, new the newest edition of the caries exam, and this involves shining a bright light through the contact areas of anterior teeth. And seeing a shadow like this, often times triangular, as we would expect a smooth surface lesion to be, the shadows can indicate the presence of inner proximal caries. Also useful for distinguishing craze lines from fractures. And craze lines are frequently confused with fractures or cracks, but can be helpfully differentiated by transillumination. This, this is really where this method shines, I think, no pun intended. So if a tooth is cracked, the fracture will block the light from traversing through and only allow a portion of the tooth to light up. Whereas if it's only a craze line, the entire tooth will shine with the presence of the light. So it can be useful for that as well. And of course, as with anything in dentistry, there's always some new technology. We have laser fluorescence with diagonodent, a digital imaging fiber optic transillumination, so a higher quality uh, transilluminator, qual quantitative light-induced fluorescence, and electrical conductance. And these, uh, according to some research out there, they provide better specificity for caries detection. I don't typically see these asked on the board exam. So focus mostly on those last four things we went over. So we can also do specific uh, exams and look for specific things when we have amalgam restorations. One of those things unique to amalgam is this bluish hue. And it's either due to leaching of corrosion products of the amalgam into the dentinal tubules or from just the color of the underlying amalgam as seen through translucent enamel. And this alone does not classify that amalgam restoration as being defective. And corrosion is actually a good thing, that amalgam creates a seal between it and the tooth over time. And we'll talk more about that when we go into the specifics of restoration later on in the series. We look for proximal overhang, marginal overhang, as we would with a composite restoration. We also look for marginal gaps or ditching. And if it's minor, we don't classify that as defective due to the self-sealing property of amalgam. But if the ditching is greater than 0.5 millimeters, it's judged as carious or caries prone, and it should be replaced or redone. We also look for voids in the amalgam and fracture lines, particularly for large amalgam restorations in posterior teeth. We want to keep an eye out for any budding fractures in that tooth structure. So more specifics of the tooth exam. We went over these, uh, these incredibly important five terms in the periodontic series, but I want to share some additional information important for the operative dentistry section here. So erosion, 
is caused by acidic foods or beverages or gastric acid bathing the teeth. Erosion is basically the chemical loss of tooth structure without bacteria involvement. No bacteria are involved in erosion. And it often manifests as cupping, which are these smooth bowl-shaped ditches on the cusp tips of posterior teeth. And it can lead to restorations, quote, standing proud, because the tooth is dissolving faster than the restoration is. So the restoration kind of looks like it's sticking up more than it should be. Next, we have abrasion, which is the loss of tooth structure by mechanical wear. Abrasion is pathologic wear of tooth structure due to an abnormal mechanical process. And most commonly, people talk about uh, toothbrush abrasion, which is absolutely a thing, but most commonly, abrasion is caused by porcelain or ceramic crowns grinding on opposing teeth. Attrition is occlusal wear from functional contacts with opposing natural teeth. So it's important that I say natural teeth because grinding a natural tooth against a ceramic crown is technically abrasion, which is what I talked about up here as being one of the most common, uh, the common causes of abrasion. And you might think, well, if we're grinding teeth together, that shouldn't that be attrition? Well, it's only true for natural teeth in the technical sense. So again, attrition, we're talking about a bruxer, someone who grinds their teeth, but those have to be natural teeth in order to be considered attrition. How I remember that is the two T's next to each other, and you can think of that as two teeth touching each other and grinding against one another, resulting in some pathologic tooth wear, and so that's how you can remember attrition from abrasion. Next, we have abfraction, which is the loss of tooth structure in cervical areas due to tooth flexure. And it's actually thought to be a multifactorial loss of tooth structure in the cervical third of the tooth, and it involves a combination of tooth flexure and maybe also some toothpaste abrasion and also chemical erosion. And lastly, we have hypersensitivity, which is the result of the exposure of dentinal tubules in the root surfaces. And I want to expound upon that a little bit more in the next slide. So root surface hypersensitivity is best explained by the hydrodynamic theory, which postulates that pain results from dentinal fluid movement that stimulates mechanoreceptors near the predentin. This is an awesome picture up here, and it shows the uh, little pores where the dentinal tubules are exposed to the outside surface here, and we have this dentinal fluid that is occupying those tubules, and then also little extensions of the mechanoreceptors near the predentin. And so some causes of this fluid being pulled, yanked and pulled on and pushed back and forth include things like temperature change, air drying, and osmotic pressure changes. So any and all of these things can manipulate this fluid, which irritates and bothers these exposed nerve endings. And that can cause some sometimes mild and sometimes very ser serious and severe uh, sensitivity. So you can see here some exposed root surfaces and uh, once the root surface ex is exposed from gum recession, for example, the thin cementum layer can be quickly worn away, and then the dentinal tubules are just exposed into the mouth and the, the oral cavity. So gluma is a desensitizing agent. We'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, liners, and again, when we talk more about the restorations and materials used in operative dentistry, but just know that gluma can occlude dentinal tubules and help reduce sensitivity. So gluma functions by, you can think of it like clogging up these holes and preventing the manipulation of that dentinal fluid. All right, treatment plan sequencing. So the concept of 
greatest need treatment planning is that what the patient needs most should be performed first. And that, by and large, dictates this order of five, the five classic phases of operative treatment planning. So the first is the urgent phase. And this is to address acute oral health needs. These are your emergency patients. So patients that are typically in a lot of pain, they may have acute infection like an abscess, and along with that, some swelling, either local in the mouth or sometimes facial swelling. So typically for these patients, we're doing some sort of endodontics, extractions, or maybe temporary restorations. And then next, if they don't have any urgent needs or those are taken care of, we talk about the control phase. Typically, this is carries control. We're controlling, we're trying to eradicate active oral disease and manage the risk factors that contribute to those diseases. And the disease we're usually talking about is caries in terms of operative dentistry. This can also be gum disease in the periodontics world. And we're also focusing a lot on oral hygiene, diet, those things that we talked about in the last video from that modified Keys jordan diagram, things that can contribute and actively increase the caries risk for a given patient. So we want to manage those things. We want to stop disease in its tracks. After that, we do what's called the reevaluation phase. This is to monitor the improvement for the patient to ensure that there is no longer any active disease. Next, we move to the definitive phase where we rehabilitate the patient's oral condition. And we want to establish optimal oral aesthetics and also function. So here's where we start talking about things like orthodontics, uh, prosthodontics, and elective orthognathic or periodontic surgery. And then lastly, we have the maintenance phase, which is to ensure excellent self-care of the patient and also include regular cleanings and exams at the dentist. So what are the criteria for restoring a tooth? Sure, we talked about uh, how to detect caries and other non-caries defects like abrasion, attrition, and abfraction, but how do we know when to restore a tooth? Well, one of the considerations is how at risk that patient is for caries and things that we should be looking for in a high caries risk patient. So those are a patient that has two or more active caries lesions, a large number of already existing restorations, they have poor dietary habits, low salivary flow, poor oral hygiene, low fluoride exposure, and also unusual tooth morphology like deep pits and fissures that are just more susceptible and vulnerable to caries. So if we have a patient like this, we should have a note in their chart that unfortunately this person is certainly at risk for caries and they may already have caries that need to be restored. And then specifically to answer this question, the lesion should extend to the DEJ radiographically and or clinically and there should be a cavitation present. That's really the most important thing here because anything before a cavitation is reversible. And so you can talk about things like fluoride treatment, um, you can talk about silver diamine fluoride, things to arrest a lesion before it progresses to the cavitated state where it's now irreversible and there's really no other better option than to restore it in some way. So I've been talking a lot about interceptive treatment after disease has occurred, but the ideal practice philosophy for general dentists is what's called preventive dentistry. And that's to prevent these, uh, these manifestations of disease before they occur. And so we want to encourage remineralization of incipient smooth surface lesions. That's reversing the disease process through the introduction of fluoride and the reversal of these high caries risk behaviors. 
And we also want to treat caries prone pits and fissures with sealants, which is often done in pediatric patients, where we talked about that in our patient management and also pe uh, pediatrics video series. So these are two of the main methods that we would be implementing the philosophy of preventive dentistry. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hafnawi, and all of my patrons out there for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams with answers explained by me. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.